Are you a soldier in the Lord's army? How about an athlete or even a farmer? Welcome to Through the Bible. If you were with us for Dr. J. Vernon McGee's last study in 2 Timothy chapter 2, those metaphors are familiar to you. But we haven't completed all the pictures that Paul wants for us in that chapter. So stay tuned, and we're about to look at ourselves as teachers, vessels, and servants when we continue our study in 2 Timothy 2, beginning at verse 11. But before we get started, I want to share with you a recording that Dr. McGee made some years ago talking about this ministry and then inviting us to join with him to take the whole word to the whole world. So I think that Dr. McGee would be pleased to know that since his passing, the ministry has expanded, and today it's reaching more people in more languages than ever before. I never thought I'd ever be in this ministry. I never expected to be a missionary. I knew all along through school I was not called to a mission field. I had heard a great missionary, a missionary doctor of the Sudan Interior Mission, tell a story that came from his field, and every fellow in the seminary was weeping, including myself. The boys, one on one side of me and one on the other, both of them went to the mission field, and they've done a great work. I never felt called to go to the mission field. The first time I made a trip to the mission field and saw what the missionary there was undergoing and his family and the tremendous, tremendous sacrifice he was making, I said to a friend of mine who went along with me, I said to him, you know, I know now why God didn't call me as a missionary. The reason is that I don't have the intestinal fortitude to make the sacrifice this man is doing here, burying himself in the jungle and giving out the word of God to just a couple hundred people. Believe me, I guess that God didn't intend for me to do it that way. And now I found myself broadcasting in all these different languages. I'm not the one doing it. I just make the tapes and they translate them and we are rejoicing in what's happening today. I don't know how it happened other than I just know God did it, and I'd like to invite you to come go along with us, and let's take the word out today. Would you like to help us fulfill Dr. McGee's mission of taking God's whole word to the whole world? Well, you can help us in two important ways. The first, and really the most important way, is to partner with us through prayer. To learn more about how you can pray specifically and regularly for the ministry of Through the Bible, you need to join our world prayer team. Just go to ttb.org forward slash pray. And then second, you can give so that others will hear the gospel and be taught how to understand the Bible for themselves. You know, in many places of the world, pastors don't really have any training other than what they can hear on the radio. So Through the Bible plays a significant role in the education of literally thousands of pastors who wouldn't be taught any other way. You know, I've said this before, and I hope you won't tune me out because it really is true. As God leads, it's your support of this ministry that's integral in keeping the Bible bus on the road. And it's through the generous support of friends like you that God's Word has reached millions across the world. We have no other sources of funding, just those who God calls to invest in this fruitful ministry, especially those who have benefited themselves. So if you've partnered with us financially or in prayer, thank you. And if you haven't yet joined us, I hope that you're going to do it today. You know, and I don't talk about this very often, but my family supports Through the Bible, and my work as host and leading the board is as a volunteer. So I can just tell you from firsthand experience, it is a blessing for us to hear how God uses us to accomplish His purposes around the world, and we would love for you to come with us in that outreach effort. And I know it's going to be a blessing to you as well. So call us today at 1-800-65-BIBLE or just visit ttb.org to join our world prayer team or make a gift to the ministry. Now, you can always write to us at Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109, in Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word that gives us such encouragement and instruction on how we can live our lives to glorify you. As we listen, Lord, help us to understand the message that you want us to hear, and then help us to apply it to our lives in ways that honor you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 
Now hop aboard as we travel to 2 Timothy chapter 11 on Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now friends, as we come back here to this second chapter of 2 Timothy, we have seen here that there are seven figures of speech that are used to describe a child of God. First of all, he's a son of God. He belongs to a new family by being born again. The second thing that he's called is an athlete, and he is to try to win a prize that is perfectly legitimate, and he is to do it by striving lawfully, that there's no shortcut. Um, That's my reason for believing that all of this gimmickry today, that you can go through a little course or you can get a few little rules and regulations. My friend, God gave 66 books, and they're pretty important, every one of them. And it takes the composite picture to give us the mind and the Word of God. An athlete can't cut the corner of a racetrack. And neither can a baseball player skip by second base without touching it. He's got to touch all the bases. And the child of God has to do that. If you're going to win, you can't take these shortcuts. Now, the fourth figure of speech, by the way, I bypassed. He's a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Now, the fourth is, in verse 6, he's a farmer. That is, he's out sowing seed. And he's going to have the wonderful benefit of the fruit of his labors. Now we come down today, and let me begin reading at verse 11. It's a faithful saying, and that probably could be put, uh, faithful is the saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. And when we come to Christ and accept him, his death becomes our death. We're identified with him, and we're raised with him. And that means that today he wants to live his life out through us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now we're told if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Now this is, I think, very strong language, but Paul also believed that faith without works is dead. Paul and James never were in contradiction at all. After all, James was talking about the works of faith, And Paul is saying that faith will produce works, and if it doesn't, something is radically wrong. Calvin put it like this, faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is not alone. Now, verse 13 again, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Now, according to the nature of Christ, he cannot accept as true one who's false. That's the reason that he gave such a scathing denunciation of the religious rulers of that day. He called them hypocrites. They were pretending to be something they were not. And if Christ accepted someone who's not genuine, why, he actually would be denying himself because he's true. He is the truth. Therefore, we must be genuine friends. That's the important thing here. Now, verse 14, he says here, of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Now, actually, this has to do about disputes of words. And actually, what we have here is the fact that God's people need to remember that we need to stick to essentials. We don't need to argue about empty words and philosophies and about our little differences. I read a letter from a pastor of Assembly of God. He said that he appreciated our ministry. He receives our notes and outlines. He recommends it to his church. He says, now, we don't agree on everything, and we don't. I can't see his point on certain things. He can't see mine either. And maybe when we get up in the presence of Christ, we're going to find out what the man said once. He said there are always three sides to every question, your side and my side, and then the right side. And maybe we both are going to have to be straightened out. But the important thing, he and I ought not to argue for the very simple reason that we agree on too many things. And that's the way he wants it, and that's the way I want it, because I think we waste a lot of time in this negative approach of trying to correct 
other believers. Now, it's hard to correct a believer, I'll tell you that. But instead of doing that, let's try to stay on the positive side. Accentuate the positive it used to be a song a long time ago, I remember. Now, verse 15, he says here, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, that's another thing. A child of God is a workman. And here he is to show thyself. Actually means to present thyself. Study to present yourself unto God. A workman here evidently means a teacher. And this is the fifth figure of speech. A child of God is a teacher. And that means he's to be a student. And he's to study that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And that means to handle rightly. Now, I want to hold that for just a moment because I feel like this is, frankly, rather important here. To rightly divide the word of God means that he's to be a skilled workman, like an artisan, a student of the word, and that he must understand that the word of God is one great bundle of truth and that the Word of God has certain right divisions. And the Bible is built according to a certain law, a certain structure, and that must be observed and obeyed as you go through the Word of God. And you just can't lift out a verse here and a verse there and ignore a passage here and a passage there. Now, that's actually the main reason that we teach the entire Word of God. Because my feeling is today that it's so easy to pick out a passage here and a passage there. But the Bible is not that kind of a book. Now, I quoted to you some time ago from an article. Now, here's a quotation from that. Now, this reveals the ignorance of a man to recognize that the Word of God is one great unity that needs to be rightly divided to properly understand it. Now, I'm quoting him. In short, one way to describe the Bible, written by many different hands over a period of 3,000 years and more, could be to say that it is a disorderly collection of 60-odd books, which are often tedious, barbaric, obscure, and teeming with contradictions and inconsistencies. It is a swarming compost of a book an Irish stew of poetry and propaganda, law and legalism, myth and murk, history and hysteria. Now, may I say to you that that man really speaks a mouthful, and his verbiage is, I would say, quite verbose, and that he reveals here a woeful ignorance of the Bible, and he reveals also what comes when anyone does not rightly divide the Word of God. Now, what do you mean by rightly dividing the Word of God? There are certain dispensations in the Word of God, and it is a different method whereby God dealt with man, always on the basis of the death of Christ being the method of salvation. But man expresses his faith in God in a different way. Abraham brought a little lamb, so did Abel. And I hope you don't take a lamb to church next Sunday morning. You're going to be entirely out of order. Now, it's all right for Mary, who had a little lamb that followed her to school. But your little lamb shouldn't follow you to church today. Because already the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world has come. We look back. Now, that's rightly dividing the word of truth. I wish that man knew a little bit about the Bible before he writes about it. And when he says it's the book that almost nobody reads, I think he belongs to that class. And before any man can speak authoritatively on any subject, he ought to know the subject to a certain extent. Now, I'd recommend that this brother study the Word of God. Now, a child of God today needs to do that. And I do want to say to you, when I began, I went to my denominational school, and to me it was utter confusion, the Bible was. And I would rather have agreed with this man. And then there was put in my hands a Schofield Reference Bible. And I got under the teaching of a wonderful pastor. And that led me to listen to men 
back in the old days like Dr. Harry Ironside, Dr. Louis Sperry Schaefer, Dr. Arthur I. Brown, and those men bless my heart and bless my soul. And the Bible became a new book. That's what he's telling Timothy here. Now he tells him, though, to shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. That is, all of this that comes to no profit whatsoever to the individual. And therefore, he is to avoid all of this. Now he says, and their word will eat as doth a gangrene, of whom are Hymenaeus and Philetus. Now I don't know much about these two men that he mentions here, but they were apostates. Who concerning the truth, now this is verse 18, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. See, actually in that day there were some that were teaching that the resurrection had already taken place, and that would mean anyone still around that missed it. Now we come to verse 19 here, and let me read this. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Now, back in the Old Testament, you will recall that the Israelite was commanded to write out a scripture and put it on his house. In other words, he was to make his house a billboard for the Word of God. And you see all this idea of display advertising today, outdoor display advertising, why it certainly makes the things that are wrong in this world look right and very attractive. Beer and liquor and many other things that are revealed there. The nightclubs, it all looks very attractive when it's on a billboard. Well, we don't put up the Word of God much today, and if it's going to be put up, friends, make sure that you write it out attractively. I think it hurts the cause of Christ to have some crude scripture written. That is, written crudely, I should say, and put up. Now, God told his people over in the sixth chapter of Deuteronomy, he says, Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand. They shall be as frontlets between thy eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. Now, they were told to do that. Now, on the church. The church has two scriptures. Number one is, the Lord knows who are his. But how are the folk on the outside to know? Well, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. And friends, that's the way that on the outside they're going to know. And that's what separation is. Separation is separation from evil, and it is separated unto Christ. If you name the name of Christ, be sure you're not living in sin. And we have today, unfortunately, some that are great about asserting doctrines and that they are fundamental in the faith. And it turns out that they've had an affair with some woman or that they have dropped into sin and been proven dishonest or something like that. Well, my friend, the way the world outside's going to know is that that sign that's on the church, you don't need it there because God knows his own, but outside the world's going to know by the life you live, and that's the only way they're going to know. And that's what he means here. Now he says, but in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Now, this is the sixth figure of speech that's used, a vessel. Verse 21 now, If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and fit for the master's use, and prepared for every good work. Now, here is a picture, if you please, of a vessel, different kinds of vessels. You remember that when we were studying Jeremiah in the 18th chapter, that we went down and saw the potter making a vessel. Well, that vessel is to be a vessel of honor, and it must be clean to be usable. In other words, if you went to a spring, suppose that you were actually dying of thirst, 
walking across the desert. You come to an oasis. There are two cups there. There's a golden cup there, highly ornamented, but it's dirty. And then there's an old crock cup. It's broken, actually, but it'll hold water. And by the way, it is a clean one. Which one would you use? Well, now, give God credit for having as much intelligence as you have. God uses clean vessels. He doesn't use dirty vessels. And you remember the Lord Jesus took those old crocs there at that wedding in Cana, Galilee, dragged them out. They were used for the ceremonies that went with Judaism. And he had them fill it with water. And he took those old broken, beat up, bent crocs and used them. God today is looking for clean vessels. And that's what he's saying here. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, love, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. How many times has he put together a life of faith, of love, and peace? And that is the thing that sums up the Christian life. Now, that is not something that should be just mouthed continually from the pulpit, and it becomes saccharine sweetness, but it's something that should get down in the pew and should be lived out. Now, verse 23, but foolish and unlearned questions uh, void, knowing that they breed stripes. Don't go into a lot of all of this arguing today. I get letters. People want to argue with me about some statement I've made. Actually, it was not an important statement, but it had to do with some minor thing. Well, friends, don't write me those letters because those are letters that I don't answer. I don't have time for that today. And we're living in a world that's on fire today. We need to get the Word of God out. And let's not argue. If you disagree with me, the chances are that you're right and I'm wrong. But I'm hard-headed. You'd never straighten me out. So let's just keep going and getting the Word out. Now, verse 24, we come to the seventh and last. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose them if God perhaps will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. And this is strange now. This is the seventh and last figure of speech. The soldier was to fight, but the servant, he is not to fight. And what do we have here? Contradiction? No paradox. My friend, when you're standing for the truth, there are times for you to stand on your two feet and let people know where you stand. Don't be a coward. Somebody said that, Silence is golden, but sometimes it's yellow. Stand for the truth. But when you're trying to win a lost man, don't argue with him. If he disagrees with you, let him disagree with him. Just keep giving him the word of God. How wonderful this is. Verse 26, And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him and his will. Isn't this wonderful? Seven figures of speech that set before us the child of God. Now, friends, we are going to have to break off there today, but next time we come to this third chapter, and here we see the apostasy that's coming. And what is the antidote? The authority of the Scriptures. Oh, the Word of God is important in these days as it's never been important. We should give out the Word of God today. All right, until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. If you've seen the signs of apostasy on the rise, then join us next time as Dr. McGee takes us further in Paul's instruction on the coming darkness and how to deal with the impending storm that will break upon the church. It's an interesting study, one that you won't want to miss. So join us right here at the same time or at ttb.org anytime. To prepare for these lessons, let's take some time to read through the third chapter of 2 Timothy. And if you're like me, you may want to read it more than once to let Paul's message soak in. Not only do we suggest that you read in preparation for the next time, but we also encourage you to read the text before and after each study. 
And to help, we provide a handy bookmark that lists the suggested reading for each study. And the best way to do it is to download our app that will allow you to read the passage that we're studying and listen to the program all from the comfort of your smartphone. You can always get a free copy of that bookmark I mentioned earlier at 1-800-65-BIBLE. Just call us and we'll send it to you. We can also put you on the mailing list where you'll get our monthly newsletter, which is a great resource as well. Or you can always sign up online over at ttb.org. Now, our study of 2 Timothy is going to continue, so join us next time as the Bible bus comes around your corner at the same time. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll be here saving a seat just for you. Through the Bible is a five-year study of God's entire Word, and together we discover God's purposes in history and our lives, found only when we believe in Jesus Christ. Do you know Him yet?